front. Let's be on our feet as we take the national prayer. I need the second Santa, Santa of the national anthem. O God of creation, direct our noble cause, guide our leaders right, help our youth the truth to know, in love and honesty to grow, and living just and true. Great lofty I attain to build a nation where justice and peace shall reign. Amen. Let's have our seats. Ladies and gentlemen, you are welcome to the 40th edition of the annual Olubide Memorial Lecture. Mr. President of Nigeria's Nigerian Surveyors, it's a great pleasure for us to have in our midst Brigadier General Muhammad Lupa Marwa Ritai, C.O.N. Mr. Guest Lecturer, sir, beside you is our president to your right, the president of the Nigerian Senior of Surveyors, Surveyor Dr. Kyle Deolua Matibi. Immediately to your left is the Deputy President, Surveyor Dr. Matthew Ibitoe. And next to him is the past president of the institution. And the second person to give this lecture in the history of the memorial lecture is the second to give lecture in the year 1983. That is Professor Venerable Francis Afalami Fadian Romo, FNIS OON. Thank you, sir. Without wasting much of our time, and since we know that our guest lecturer has got a lot of engagement, you will permit me to introduce to you past president of the institution, because this event is actually to recognize the efforts of our heroes past. As I've introduced earlier, you have beside you past president Francis Fadian Roku, FNIS, OON. And sitting opposite you, first on the, from your right, sir, is past president, Sovio Dr. Atilola Olushola Atilola, FNIS. Next to him is Sovio Yakubu Mekano. FNIS, PPNIS. And next is Sovio Honorable Olambodi Adiaga, FNIS, PPNIS. Olubodi Adiaga. Next is Sovio Barista Ben Omar Ayibe, FNIS, PPNIS. And the next is Sovio Aki Oyebola, FNIS, PPNIS, immediate past president and session of Kofina Bodies in Nigeria. On the item with you is the second president, the president of the Sovio Council of Nigeria, to your extreme left, Sovio Clement Mwabiche, FNIS. And to your right here, is the representative of the Soviet General Federation, Soviet Mrs. Sali Omoha, Ekago, FLS, and a representative of the man whom this program is named after, uh, a representative of the family of the man whom this program was named after, Mr. Aki Olumide. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sobio Yusuf Arolambo. I'm the Public Secretary of the Institution. Without wasting more time, the program of events is on page 13. I will invite the President of Nigeria of Sobio, 
Sylvia Protocard, the Lua Motivi, to give his welcome address, the President. Checks. 
the profession must continue to work to possibly positively impact the society and it must begin with each and every one of us. Let this change begin with you and me. I can see a brighter, more prosperous future for our profession and our dear country. Our guest speaker today is an accomplished professional, a knowledgeable and distinguished member of society. Brigadier General Mohammed Banova retired. He's a leader who has and is still providing visionary dedicated leadership in the various assignments they have been starting with in the service of our great country. I welcome our guest, distinguished guest speaker, other invited guests, and friends of our profession and the virtual world to benefit of the rich experience of our guest speaker. Thank you. Thank you. And I love you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's put our hands together once again for the President, Nigeria Institution of Surveyors. Mr. Guest speaker, sir. If you thought about today, I will call on the Vice President of International Institution to take the profile of Sobio City Olumide. I invite Sobio Vincent Olumide Adiwebi to do the honor. Thank you very much, our National Publicity Secretary. I once again welcome our guest speaker and thank you for gracious to be our speaker at this 48th edition of this great lecture. Um, I have a very simple responsibility outside organizing this event, which is to read the profile of our late sage and first president of our great institution. Our first president, Parsipe Tudius Olumide, was born around 1890. He was one of the pioneers of, the surveying, of surveying in Nigeria and had all his training and education in Nigeria. At that time, the channel of entry into surveying was through civil engineering. Paolo Mide had a survey training in the first training school for surveyors in Nigeria and indeed Africa, the School of Surveying in New York, which was established in 1908. No doubt about it, the training then was of the highest standard and appointment. His contemporaries then, were late Messrs. Ayede Johnson, Bola Cole, and Craig, all of whom left the service prematurely. Paolo Mide decided to remain for many years. The only Nigerian in the most senior post any Nigerian was allowed to attain at the time. He took responsibility for training other Nigerians and even some Europeans whom he trained but who were eventually promoted over and above him. He gave courageous and purposeful leadership to the Africans in the different cadres of the surveying profession and the then civil service. He displayed industry, integrity, devotion to duty, and strength of character. He sacrificed personal gains for the advancement of professional goals. Paolo Mede retired from the civil service, having refused to be lured to stay a day longer than the prescribed 55 years retirement age. And even in spite of the release of the Harrigan reports, which directed the removal of the differentiation between Africans and Europeans in service, he still left. Paolo Mide in 1934 co-founded the License of Yours Association together with great nationalists Herbert Macaulay, Messrs. Craig, Ayede, and Began Benjamin. The association met up into the Lands of the Association of Nigeria in 1960, with Paolo Mide as its first chairman. In 1966, at the Enugu Conference of the Association, the name Nigerian Institution of Surveyors was adopted, and Paolo Mide became its first president. The institution appreciated in appreciation of his service and as a show of confidence reposed in his leadership. 
made him life president. And so he remained until his death in 1970. Council then decided to immortalize his memory by the institution of the Ulumide Memorial Lecture Series. The first of this lecture series was held in the year 1982, and that is why today we have the pleasure of celebrating the 40th edition. In concept, the annual event was to be an opportunity for professionals and members of the public to be treated to a formal communication of ideas on topics of professional, academic, and indeed public interest. What perhaps may have remained unsung and largely uncelebrated was Paolo Mide's heroic and pioneering and dedicated roles in nationalistic struggle for independence. It was largely due to his efforts that the post of the Director of Federal Service, now renamed the Office of the Soviet General of the Federation, was indigenized barely two years after independence. Ladies and gentlemen, Paolo Mide was a distinguished Nigerian, a man of great foresight and an accomplished applied scientist. With a great sense of integrity and devotion to duty, he intelligently and meticulously laid the solid foundation for the noble profession of surveying in this country. He deserves nothing less than the honor which this lecture series represents. It is my pleasure and my duty to welcome you as your Vice President International to the 40th edition of the annual Bulumide Memorial Lecture Series. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Sovio Olumide Adewebi. Before now, I used to think he's a member of the Olumide family, but we are all members of that family. Put your hands together for Sovio Olumide Adewebi. Ladies and gentlemen, we are almost where we are heading to. Next on the agenda is the introduction of the guest lecturer by way of reading his brief citation. With the permission of past presidents and the president of the Nigerian Institution of Surveillance, I will kindly request the former governor of my state, the state of aquatic splendor, uh, to please be on his feet while I read your brief citation, sir. Thank you, sir. Put your hands together for the presentation. Before I start, I would like that we correct the OFR to CON. While our own emeritus professor, Fadian Brokum, was being honored as an officer of the Order of Ninja, the OFR of our guest lecturer has been eliminated to CON and the, pro and the program book was actually produced before the we tender our apologies if you see that but that is just the true situation sir. Profile of Brigadier General Muhammad Puba Marwa retired CON Brigadier General Muhammad Puba Marwa CON was appointed the eleventh chairman chief executive officer of the Nigerian Drug Law Enforcement Agency on the 15th January 2021. He resumed office on 18th January and hit the ground running with the launch of offensive action before uh, with the uh, launch of offensive action. Before MDLA, Marwa's best degree includes a meritorious military career where he sat in many important positions across the military formations, including as Brigade Major, 23 Amon Brigade, Academic Register, the Nigerian Defense Academy, Deputy Defense Advisor, Nigerian Embassy, Washington, D.C., and Defense Advisor, Nigerian Permanent Mission to the United Nations, New York. He was, at first, the military governor of Borno State in, from 1990 to 1992 and later the military administrator of Lagos State, 1996 to 1999, where he earned a reputation as a turnaround manager and management guru. Put your hands together for our guest lecture. Post-military service, 
Brigadier General Marwa, who has mastered in public and international affairs at the University of Pittsburgh in 1985 and public administration in Harvard in 1986, also served as a Nigerian ambassador to South Africa, Lesotho, and Swaziland, the one that is known as Eswatini now. His previous experience as chairman of the Presidential Advisory Committee on the Elimination of Drug Abuse, Paseda, from 2018 to 2020, prepared him for the turnaround task at the NPLA. Hence, Marwa hit the ground running as NPLA chairman, with reforms aimed at resuscitating the agency. In no time, he invigorated NPA with ramped up drug supply reduction campaign which, is, which in 10 months delivered over 10,000 arrests, 1,000 convictions, and over 3 million kilograms of assorted drugs and cars. And cars seeds valued over 120 billion naira. He also embarked on a strategic restructuring of the, of the agency to make it retrofitted for modern challenges of enforcing drug laws. This includes expansion of the directorate, institution of a performance reward scheme, and other career incentives, and repositioning of the agency for efficiency and visibility. His efforts were rewarded with results that attracted commendation from government of foreign countries and the agency's strategic partners who have shown renewed trust in the NDLA in words and action. In his first year, of, in the first year in charge, NDLA gained international recognition as a regional force in drug law enforcement and attracted partnership from similar agencies around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the video general Muhammad Boba Marwa, as he delivered his lectures. President of the Nigerian Institution of Affairs, the Deputy President, our eminent members, uh, the High Chief, the esteemed Vice Presidents, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I listened to the profile, my profile that was raised, and the reader said that I was the 11th chairman of the NDLG. Um, for information, I was also the 11th governor of Borno State. <laughs> Chairman of the Defense Industries Corporation. <laughs> so that number 11 has been <laughs> trailing me. Now, as a young officer in 1978, I accompanied my, my principal at the time, John Lentuman, on assignment to East Africa. Tanzania and Uganda were having the war and we went to Seth. So we had the opportunities to sit with Idi Amin, who was then the president. And I observed on the official uh, portraits that they wrote uh, Al Haji, Dr. Phil Marshall, and Idi Amin. E, which stood for conqueror of the British Empire. <laughs> That's what they wrote. And so today, I'm also giving myself F N I S.
They are one of the most critical and most important professions. And that is why we are the bedrock of all meaningful developments. And I wish you more successes.
that illicit substances do constitute dangers to national development. Therefore, it is in our national interest to know this truth and to curb the proliferation, trafficking, and abuse of controlled and banned substances. <coughs> Now uh, let's have a look at national development and its substances. The term national development is so broad and amorphous that it includes all aspects of the life of an individual, family, community, and the nation at large. Development in this sense implies all round and balanced development of different aspects and facets of the nation, including political, economic, social, cultural, scientific, and material dimensions, among other matrices. As noted by the economic John Wade, I quote, national development is the total effects of all citizen forces and addition to the stock physical, human resources, knowledge, and skill." Unquote. The United Nations Decade Report defines national development as growth plus change, specifically change in social and cultural as well as economic dimensions that is qualitative as well as quantitative. <coughs> When we speak about the dangers of illicit substances to national development, we are looking at how proliferation by production, trafficking and sales and abuse of illicit substances, how these are undermining the organic development of the country. In other words, how drug use is impeding economic growth, how it is rendering asunder social cohesion, how it is negating the maximization of the potential of citizens, and how solving these problems is consuming much needed government revenue that could be useful for other developmental endeavors. On these subjects, we don't need to talk abstraction. There are examples from developed countries that have gone through the tribulation of illicit substances just as there are studies on the havoc wrecked by illicit drugs in third world countries. Now let's look at the American lessons. Taking for example the United States report which is titled How Illicit Drug Use Affects Business and Economy. This report was authored by the Office of the National Drug Control Policy which was directly under the White House at the time President Obama was America's president. The report noted that America's federal government and business community are increasingly recognizing the negative consequences of substance use on the country's economy and the nation's workforce. Among other key points, the report acknowledged that the abuse of drugs and alcohol is costly for America and if left untreated, places a burden on the workplace, healthcare system, and communities. Data in the report painted a stark illustration of the consequences of drug use in American society by estimating the economic cost to the country. For example, 2007, the economic cost of drug abuse in the United States was estimated at 193 billion US dollars. Out of this, lost productivity accounted for 120 billion dollars. This was mainly due to participation in drug abuse treatment, incarceration, and premature death. On the other hand, $11 billion was spent on healthcare for drug-related medical consequences. And finally, the sum of $61 billion was spent on criminal justice 
primarily for criminal investigation, prosecution, and incarceration and victim process. Other reports and surveys highlighted the detrimental effects of substance abuse on business, productivity, and competitiveness. Statistics showed that almost 30% of drug abusers are not part of the labor force, and unemployed workers were twice as likely to be drug users. They are also more likely to have the highest record of absenteeism from work, also likely to have difficulty holding down a job, with some of them reportedly working for three or more employers in a given year, and more likely to report missing two or more workplaces in a month due to illness or injury. Overall, their productivity is curtailed, and this eventually affects national output and GDP. When you come to education, the abuse of PC substances also has a corrosive effect. Studies have shown a pattern of school performance, including the following facts. That students who are not marijuana users are more than twice as likely to report an average rate of A than those who are using marijuana. Obviously. College students who use prescription stimulant medications for non medical purposes typically have lower grade point averages and are more likely to be heavy drinkers and users of other illicit drugs. They are also more likely to meet diagnostic criteria for dependence on alcohol and marijuana. And students who use illicit drugs are more likely to skip class more frequently and spend less time studying. At the end of the day, society bears the loss, losing bright minds to illicit substances. While we are yet to have well-organized studies and data by the Americans, we cannot ignore the fact that the situation in our country mirrors some of the drug problems of America. For instance, when you have the opportunity to talk to a few Nigerians who are once drug dependent, that are now rehabilitated or their families, their stories of the cost of treatment, the trauma and the setbacks they experienced are frightening epiphanies. If we add up the losses of these individuals and their families, it will be glaring to us the magnitude of development setbacks in this country on account of the abuse of illicit. Now, let's take a quick look at the Latin American case stories. Looking at how illicit substances undermine national development, Latin American countries will be significant. This is where the copper leaf and cocaine originate from. In this regard, we are looking at the Andean countries of Bolivia, Colombia, and Peru. A study of the three countries indicated that, and I quote, the impacts of the activities linked to the illicit cycles of cultivation, manufacture, and traffic weaken national economies, call into question the rule of law, jeopardize social peace and ultimately undermine the frameworks so essential to sustainable human development, end of quote. In other words, illicit substance activities impede development in these countries. To be specific, Colombia is an example of how the illicit drug trade, if allowed to thrive, can subvert a country's growth and development by engendering instability and chaos. The world still remembers how the Medellin and Cali cartels in the 1970s and 1980s grew into powerful transnational criminal enterprises 
and eventually attacked the Colombian state by unleashing narco terrorism, characterized by violent murders, kidnappings, bombings, and corruption that almost turned Colombia into a failed state. And we can only imagine the type of development Latin American country would have achieved without the destruction of Bocaliv, Bocain, and the cartels. Similarly, when you look at some of the hotspots of violence and war in the world today, such as Syria, Somalia, Afghanistan, and Mexico, they all have a common denominator as major sources or important transit hubs of EDC substances. That speaks volumes that where EDC substances thrive with impunity, development indices are always on the deficit side. Back to Nigeria. We have people who are skeptical each time we mention the connection between illicit drugs and crime and insecurity. But they cannot wish away the incontrovertible evidence that supports the thesis. There is a definite linkage between the criminalities in our society and drug abuse. Firstly, the camps of insurgents and bandits cleared by our troops are always littered with illicit drugs, ranging from cannabis to pharmaceutical opioids and other controlled drugs like vitamin C. Secondly, the NDIDA has intercepted and arrested several drug dealers who were on a mission to deliver shipments of illicit substances to bandits their hideouts. Sometime in September uh, of thereabouts last year, the, my counterparts from Saudi Arabia, the General Directorate of Narcotics and Drugs and Illicit Substances, they paid me a visit here in my office with uh, some information and intelligence on the particular ship. We went after the shipment and eventually pinned it down in a paper. Now, this was a container. We opened the container. We brought up the three marble polishing machines outside. These were machines, normal machines, no drugs. We looked into the container everywhere, not drugs. So we decided to take the risk of tearing yes. the machines. We tore the machines, still no drugs. So, uh, but we noticed the electric motors. There appeared to be far more electric motors on the machine than they are not to be. And those electric motors did not appear to be connected fundamentally to parts that are here. So we removed the motors, there are 19 of them. We then brought our dogs. And the dogs showed that something inside. But these are complete machines, so we had to get electric drills to, to tear out the motors and we found octagon pins inside. 500,000 octagon pins. Now those pins in the Gulf cost $20, so that's about $10 million. So the machines were actually constructed to conceal the drugs. So you can build a machine with $40,000, where it will carry $10 million worth of drugs. Now 
Now, what is important is for you to know what, what's, what's captable, isn't it? What, are, what is captable here? This is an amphetamine type pill, which, once consumed, chemically influences the person to become violent, fearless, no sleep for several days, no few sleep, no hunger, or almost like a machine. Now, that's 500,000 of those things. Imagine if that had gone to the bandits and the insurgents and so on. Now, bandits and Boko and insurgents arrested by security agents have also exhibited withdrawal syndrome days after the arrest. And some of them admitted they took it during interrogation. The bandits and the insurgents are on record as responding when they ask them, what, is, what do you fear most? They said they are afraid of running out of drugs. That's their most important uh, fear. We have had testimonies from rescue hostages who describe how their doctors abuse illicit substances. Some of us will also remember that one of the fugitives was recaptured by NDLA officials after escaping from the Uje Correctional Facility Center. Was caught with a rose of cannabis. They just escaped from, uh, from prison and quickly went back to the street. So these instances prove beyond doubt that there is a connection between the abuse of psychoactive drugs and criminal actions. Illicit drugs are catalysts to crime and have been one of the contributing factors to Nigeria's unending insecurity. <coughs> Occasionally, you hear some skeptics argue that some people who smoke cannabis still function very well and do not exhibit violent or extreme behavior. They forget, however, to acknowledge that a lot of people caught in a crime or involved in violent crime are habitual users of the substance. This country still remembers the episodic outbreak of methamphetamine called Ngurumi across states in the southeast in the last quarter of 2021. For three months, Nigerians had a foretaste of the kind of upheaval that abuse of methamphetamine can cause society. We have ample evidence and real life experience to know that the result of abuse of illicit substances is instability and there cannot be meaningful development where you have chaos and instability. We should remember also that at its height, banditry prevented people in several northern states from going to the farm or even market or travel from one town to another, which crippled the local economy. So while the abuse of illicit substances was not the direct cause of banditry, it is a contributing factor towards its escalation. And therefore, it is an indirect factor that undermines the development of that region. How is Nigeria responding? In 2019, this country was sitting on a keg of gunpowder, if I may use the phrase. We have 10.6 million cannabis users in Nigeria. 10.6 million, probably the highest. Anyway, many don't always get the significance of this figure until we humanize it further by saying that the population of people who abuse cannabis in this country is more than the entire population of Portugal, for example, or the United Arab Emirates. Or, taking it further, a combination of the following countries' population, Botswana, 
Swaziland, Lesotho, Gambia, and Sierra Leone, all combined. And what is worse, our country's drug use prevalence of 14.4% is one of the highest in the world, compared to the global average of 5.6%. So while 10.6 million use cannabis, about 15 million use all the substances, illicit substances. Now, the 15 million figure, the actual figure is 14.3 million, is based on the UN survey of 2018. That that survey was for the ages 15 to 64, which covers 100 million Nigerians. So that's the other 100 million not accounted for in the survey. So when you say 14.3 or 15 million, there is this crutching. There is still more to it, which we will find out in subsequent uh, service. So these figures have implications. They have accompanying problems, which if left unattended, will in a matter of a few years snowball into a major, major problem that may become an overwhelming albatross capable of undermining meaningful national development. But today, I have to say, we have hope that we can, in the long run, handle the drug challenges. <laughs> the present administration of President Mohamed Buhari has demonstrated an understanding of the dynamics of natural development by taking the bold step to expand the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency and reposition it for better results. In the past 20 months, the leadership, men, women, and officers of the agency have been working to shut down Nigeria's illicit drug complex. So far, we are achieving results. 30th of July this year, the agency located and dismantled two clandestine methamphetamine laboratories in Lagos and Anambra states. Our offensive against cannabis continues on a better. On September 18th this year, we recorded a historic seizure of 2.1 tons of cocaine in the world. I'm sure you may have read. Now, that was a classic operation because we were able to pick the five parents scattered around Lagos at the same moment. Because if you were a few seconds earlier, you would tell the other one to go away. But it was very professionally accomplished and no shots of fired and no lives were lost. We have also made massive seizures of Tramadol and Codin this year and have been able to stave off the occurrence of an opioid epidemic. To the bargain, we have arrested in the last 20 months over 19,000 traffickers. And 3,000 of them are serving jail sentences as we speak. Within the same period, we have seized over 5.4 million kilograms of assorted substances. And we have destroyed over 700 hectares of cannabis plantations across the country. So we are not just arresting them uh, in the warehouses, but we are going to the roots where they are planting and, and we are destroying them. Because the drug storage is destroying the country. All 
all communities are facing this challenge. I would say all families and all communities. At the same time, we are also working on treatment, which is very essential if we want to avoid the drug use syndrome that is plaguing America and other developed countries today. So to this end, we have commissioned a 24-7 drug abuse call center, and we are also working on increasing the number of rehabilitation centers in the country. So while the NDLDA is facing up to the challenge of seizures, arrests, law enforcement, prosecution, we also are looking at the challenge of the users, the people, the consumers. You have to face it. You have to face the market. As long as there's a market, the supply will find a way. So we have to address the two together. And within the past 20 months or so, we have treated and counseled and released from, from our, uh, over 12,000 Nigerians who have problems. So, when people have issues of drug use, we encourage them to come to us and seek help. But anyone that puts cannabis in a big bag, 50 kilograms, and comes and says, I have a problem <laughs> that I, I can't help it. <laughs> we know this is a, a dealer. <laughs> and we will not allow that one to, to go back home. <laughs> We've also done a lot of training on drug abuse prevention, treatment, and care. In fact, just a few months ago, um, the governor's wives, all the governor's wives came and we trained them for two days on DPTC, uh, drug prevent, drug, drug abuse prevention, treatment, and care. But we have to face prevention. Prevention is better than cure. And lastly, we have started a national campaign against drug abuse, which is titled War Against Drug Abuse, WAD. This was launched by the President last year. And the broad objective is preventive drug abuse to be attained through the enlistment of the cooperation of members of society who will join NDLE in a concerted effort to curb the drug and I know that the NIS is part of this. I believe that with the support of Nigerians, NDLEA will succeed in its mandate of safeguarding the public health and well being of society against illicit substances. This is the only sure way to attain socio-economic development of our country and the well-being of the citizen. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together for Brigadier General Muhammad Mubarakwa on the well deliver lecture. Let's do more. We can do more before you get to the seat. I would like to let the guest speaker know that part of the friendship we are forming with NDLE is that sometime in 2019, a group of three surveyors carried out this, uh, a research on remote detection of cannabis plantation in Indoria Forest. I have going to be one of them. Thank you very much, sir. And our result shows that with remotely sensed data, you can achieve 70% accuracy of where cannabis are planted without actually getting there, which reduces the risk 
your men are exposed to in trying to cope the problem of cannabis plantation from this source. Thank you very much, sir. You will all agree with me that the lecture, the lecture is very rich and very apt. To me, it's personal, and to some of it is. Last three weeks, we lost one of the finest surveyors in this country. He was kidnapped and killed in the presence of his mother. Surveyor Alam, he happened to be my best friend. If not under the influence of drug, nobody would be able to kill a child in the presence of his mother. So, in this respect, I would like us to accept it. Jobs have moment of silence. May his soul rest in peace. We want to appreciate our guest speaker for today. We quickly want to take a comments from the floor. Residents, at your directive, please. Please, we want to take minimum of three and maximum of five comments on the lecture we just received today. Oh, residents, number two, and comment, please. I have many hands. Okay, number three, number four, so we are budget number five. <laughs> to the president, sir. Yes, I understand. Then the last one, sir. President, let me start from the, our daddy, daddy, Fajemi Roko, sir. O O N. Thank you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> the president of the Nigerian Institution of Surveillance. Uh, 
and he passed on about a month ago. He was the deputy vice chancellor of the University of Lagos. Secondly, <clears throat> uh, I need to appreciate very, very much the lecture that has been given. Uh, and of course, to appreciate the lecturer, the giver of the lecture. He's someone that uh, I think many of us admire. Uh, and is an example, I must say, of what many Nigerians will aspire to be. Some of us know him from afar off. We know that he seeks and he loves to serve the country. He has, in fact, offered himself in many positions, and in some positions they've said, no, we don't want you there. But he has not relented. And he has taken up this assignment uh, as if he's, uh, and I believe it be because he's God sent. The, the FDLDA that we hear about now uh, is totally different from what it has been in the past. And we must say that we are grateful to you for your leadership. And it shows that in anything that you put your hands on, you, you ensure that uh, uh, the best comes out of it. Uh, so many information has been given uh, in the course of the lecture, and uh, some of us are aware of the progress, the tremendous progress that NDLA has made over the past few months. We keep hearing no good news about arrests and so on and so forth. But I was commenting as it was uh, uh, during the lecture that I even became more and more afraid. I, I knew, you know, the illicit drug usage was a problem in the country, uh, but he has even uh, shown that it is far more than I thought it was. Uh, and we need all to uh, support the NDLEA and fight uh, the menace. What is happening in Northern America, well, in the Americas, really, is uh, is something that we must not allow to get into our lands. Uh, the, the question, I, I don't even think it is a question, but uh, maybe an advice that I thought I should, uh, I should give uh, is that Because we know that the war against the uh, drug warlords, uh, as they are called, okay. Okay. Uh, because the, the because the fight against those who are uh, uh, trafficking is is very very hard. I would also be grateful if NDLG can up their, uh, the, the, the other part of it which came at the later part of this lecture, that is uh, attending to rehabilitate you know, those who are drug users and so on. 
because that is also very, very essential. Thank you very much. Okay, to the President of Solos Council of Nigeria, sir. <coughs> Mr. President of NIS, distinguished uh, guest lecturer, permit me to stand on the existing protocol already established. I'm afraid uh, the guest lecturer is running very late to catch a flight, so I will not really add more to the time. Mr. Guest Lecturer, sir, I just want to avert your mind to two areas. Is there any connection between unemployment and the surge in drug abuse? Because this, the age, most of the people who are involved in this drug abuse are not people of our age. But the younger elements. So I'm just wondering. The second point I want to make is that I think I'm hearing for the first time that there is something like rehabilitation of uh, drug addicts in Nigeria. But I would like to say that it would appear that we should do more on that area. And maybe ADLA may not be the agency to handle that. The governor's wife, uh, like we are here on the high table, but this, uh, that type of job requires grassroots rural mobilization and efforts. So I'm looking at a situation where a, 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 that rehabilitation, the proactive effort should be done at the rural level so that before it reaches the point where the person becomes an addict. Thank you, sir. Please, your Dr. Atilola. You are welcome, sir. Thank you very much um, uh, for this honor. Um, straight to the point, and um, standing on the existing protocol, and um, thanking the, the lecturer for a wonderful job done. Um, I want to observe that um, drug users, although it's prevalent across social strata, but I think mainly the socio-economic uh, issues in this country, where we have majority of the youth jobless, also contribute to this. And therefore, uh, for us to move forward, there must be a paradigm change in terms of governance, ensuring that uh, the use are catered for, uh, apart from the um, ideas or areas that are identified by uh, the lecturers. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Our uh, best speaker, sir. You have the honor to answer the comments. Thank you very much indeed for the uh, for the questions and uh, comments. I agree with uh, Chief General Bobokan. There's need to give attention to drug demand use. That that's why we're professing the truth, and it is also in our acts that we are to eradicate the cultivation, production, trafficking, and use of drugs and illicit substances. So we face the use. We have a full directorate called the Directorate of Drug Demand Reduction, which faces this aspect. And the first job is prevent. And this preventive involves all of us. It involves parenting, because parents now are afraid of their children, instead of the other way around. I've interacted with very senior people uh, in and out of government who confessed to me that they don't go to bed in the night until after they are sure that 
their children have slept. Because children now kill their parents too. And when a boy asks for 20,000 naira from the mom, and she says, but I gave you 20,000 yesterday, what, what do you want to they quickly dive into the kitchen, pick a knife, and before you know it. So parenting, community level, the entire school system is in the curriculum now. The Ministry of Education has worked on that. Our clergy, our traditional institution, mass advocacy has to go media and this type of fora. So the drug demand is as important as the drugs of bad reduction. And I couldn't agree more. We also have, uh, going straight to the next question about uh, unemployment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Poverty is a key driver, is the most uh, important of the drivers for drug use throughout society, not, not just in Nigeria. There are studies to this effect. Because when you are poor, jobless, no food, nothing, only misery and frustration, you try to escape. Yeah. And then they go that way. That's why we don't necessarily criminalize the use. Once we confirm through our own methods that you are a user, not a dealer, we take you in and help. And we have counseling and rehabilitation centers in all our homes. We also um, have, while we're on this subject, the Federal Ministry of Health, they have 11 model centers. You know, most of you know ARO, Nabeokta. And uh, there is one here in Abuja, Katuna, Mejuri, and so on. Then down the state level, why we're interested in the governor's wives is because there's a structure for drug control at the federal, which I chair. Then at the state, every state has a drug control committee, which ought to be chaired by the governor himself because of the crisis that we are facing in this sector. But because the governors are very busy, the next person that would appear to fit in that role is the wife of the governor because they have access to the governor and they can get a lot of help and their mothers also. <laughs> and now it cascades to the local government and the community. So, so they are rehab centers and they are private ones. And the, institu the institution can also consider if you are able to build your own rehab center, this is service. Communities have done that. I was in Okomosho, I didn't come from Okomosho here. Okomosho one, they did a rehab center, which, which I happily uh, commissioned. So the private rehab centers are very expensive. There are three in this after, which have to be 1 million a month to rehabilitate a family. Yes, so we, we appeal um, for, for more. And the other thing to remember, <laughs> connecting with the unemployment, is often when you rehabilitate the drug users who were probably there because of poverty, then the chances are pretty high that if they go back to the same, it, it happens, yes. And that's why uh, those uh, of you here who are in Lagos while I was uh, working with the state government would remember the area boys and how we took care of them. We built the rehab center in Sherry, rehabilitated them, and trained, to taught them skills. And then we didn't end up there. Because when you teach somebody how to sew, or how to wear uniforms, and he goes with the skill, there's no money to buy the machine or to start. 
then you've not really done anything. That's right. So I always say this, um, when we, we teach them skill and give them something to start with, so that uh, it, will, it will continue. Um, I think uh, the last person to have to do it with joblessness. Which, which is a uh, link. But I take the opportunity to mention that uh, the president is fully seized of this. Is fully seized of this during the committee, presidential advisory committee uh, for the elimination of drug abuse, which I shared some uh, copy of years back. That was one of our reports for a massive intervention at the macroeconomic level for poverty. I think those are one of the considerations, among others, that led the government to uplift the policy of 100 million Nigerians out of poverty over the next 10 years. And so we are hopeful that the next government will continue with this, uh, with this trend. Thank you so much. I have to run away now. Thank you very much, sir. So, um, sir, we can't keep you waiting, but uh, we always pre um, present a uh, plaque, and I would like the president to be down here so that he can present it to the guest lecturer. And that, okay, okay, so that after then there will be good ph photograph. in a cool manner, but if I were rushing at this point. So I, I will have to rush to present this award to our guest speaker. But before I do that, some few minutes ago, the guest speaker was talking to me. He was absenting. And what he was saying was that uh, the NIS should please contact him on the information given by the MC on how to use our technology to discover the in, um, farm lands uh, where there are these um, cannabis and I'm sure I will do that. We will write the proposal and we will write Having said that, this award is presented to you, sir. If we call it Award of Merit for the being the guest lecturer at our fourth forty eighth Columni Day Memorial Lecture. We enjoyed the lecture. We believe we as NIS, and now that you are FNIS, <laughs> we benefit for the lecture too. On that basis, I present this award to you. If you grew up in Lagos when it was the governor, you remember this song. Marwa o ma baja yelo, Marwa o ma baja yelo, Ijeje ma dawa lo, Marwa o ma baja yelo. I will invite the guest lecturer to come down with the members of the ITM who are the past presidents to join him. Okay, the members of the ITU, then the ESCO. The ITU, are you there? Move, Lambo. Thank you. Escos, one second. Escos.
the graphics. Get the person there with you. so easy to start something and break it up at the shortest time. Ah, uh, it's not easy. I'm a member of Rotary. I know what we do in Rotary. I'm a member of several foundations. I'm, I'm a geologist. So when I speak, I have, a, I mean, not so much of the idea of the past presidents and the very old people here with the regards, but I know that things can, beautiful things can come up so easily and crumble with the easiest, you know, so again, I want to thank you. I, I, I can't say too much because one will spend um, so much time, but it's just an instance of saying thank you for you know, leaving the legacy of Paolo Mide. When they say, Aki, Sheomado City Yai, I imagine, sorry I'm speaking to you, but Sheomado City Yai, if Tim Babloy will keep working to she, the name Olu Mide is, I mean, I can't even carry the name. I'm just one of them. The, the great man, the Cyprian Theodosius Lumide, that you are celebrating here today, has you know laid the foundation. I'm practically just walking, you know, walking in those um, the prints. And again, Mr. President, sir, I I was here last year. I met you. I mean, you're still our president. I want to appreciate you. I want to thank every member of your executive. And I say, even with my my, my late uncle. Um, 
engineer ni yodu me he gave me maybe i'm not supposed to say it but permit me he gave me a picture of the very first lecture the one you had that um, you know we had i think the man came from germany and he said he was at that lecture i said uncle i couldn't have been there because i was in school secondary school then and it's the same wonderful successful story every day day in day out for 40 years i can only say that the like a great man once said, the reward of hard work is more work. But this time around, more work with resounding successes. I pray and I thank you all. Thank you, sir. We want to appreciate you and again our greetings to the entire family. And by the next year, 41 edition, we will have the members of the family here with us. Thank you, thank you so much. We have goodwill messages from the second president, the office for the Soviet General of the Federation, and from the chairman board of fellows. So permit me with the honor of the president to hand over the mic to the president of Soviet Council of Nigeria, Soviet Seha Norwichi FNI. Mr. President, sir. Uh, distinguished past presidents, fellows, distinguished professional colleagues, I feel highly honored to be called upon to do a goodwill message. On behalf of the members of Council of the Soyuz Council of Nigeria, the management and staff of uh, Soweos Council of Nigeria. We send you felicitations on the Nubide Memorial Lecture. It has always been something we look forward to. And every year it looks like we add a pen to that exercise by the quality of the lecture that is usually delivered. Permit me, Mr. President, to lash onto what the Lubide grandson said. If you have that cocktail of photographs, I think we may wish to do a historical album of the Lubide Memorial Lecture and possibly launch it sometime in future and archive it so that uh, prosperity those coming after us. It, 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 it's a problem in this country that we discard historical facts, arts. So if those things are available, people may want to look at it. And I have always canvassed a survey museum for Nigeria. Coming to Sogon, I want to say that I am lashing in on the job already done by those there to see whether we can streamline a lot of things. I am sure the president of NIS is aware that we have done a standard pamphlet on MCPD in such a way that you earn credits for MCPD. It is structured in such a way that it is a bit more technical. And as long as we have it, immediately we finished it. As the Nigerian survey wanted to register in uh, Alberta, Canada. And one of the things they asked for was the record of uh, MCPD. So we have sent it to um, NIS. But they were part of the making of the document so that possibly by next year, after they might have agreed with the points, then they can take off. The only thing is that I think some of them be interested in taking a share of the dividends of democracy coming out from that. It will not it will not be too much. I think hopefully by next year we should do a stakeholder stuff. 
to cover some of the specifications that we are currently reviewing or new ones that we are trying to look at. One of the, and then the enabling act, so that people can make input, come to a conference and agree on something, and we take it back to council for approval, and then see whether we can start the process of uh, updating our laws, updating our specification, updating our regulations. Uh, this is not a time for a report, but I know that the disciplinary committee has taken off. We met some few days back. So the whole value chain of discipline in the profession is now fully on, on board. Before, it was always being stopped at the SIB level because the enabling act specified so and so must be head the disciplinary committee be members. So that value chain is on. We have constituted the disciplinary committee. They have met handled one or two cases two, three days back. And as the cases come, we'll take it. The only thing that uh, someone is pleading with you, both uh, surveyor generals and practicing surveyors, if you look at the regulations, we need a record of your practice for the year. It will help us. Once again, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, the past president. I keep, uh, I get highly elated when I see you people in good health coming to be with us, being a burden of uh, oracle, I told to say, because we refer to you people for many things. I get, I get, I get very happy when I see you people, and uh, you are in a, a form that, uh, if not for the Nigerian population policy, has put it at four. You may wish to increase it more. Thank you, and may God help you. Thank you so much, sir. We recognize all support council member present. Thank you for support. We appreciate your help. Also, we recognize the Hampton Registrar, so we are currently looking very nice. Please stand up for recognition over there. Thank you, thank you. Please permit me now to call on the representative of the Office of the Soviet General of the Federation, Soviet Mrs. Sadi Kako, FNIs. You are welcome. Mr. President, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this is not a time for speeches. Um, the Surveyor General of the Federation, Abdugani Adeyemi Adebomei, would have loved to be here himself, but he's unavoidably absent um, outside the country on an official assignment. Um, I have always um, preached collaboration and uh, I would like to say that um, if anybody wants to move very fast, the person may go alone. The same may apply to an organization. And so if NIS, OSGOV, SOCOM want to go far in the profession, they need to go together. But that, that's the idea. You want to move fast, go alone. You want to go very far, go together. And so I want to, on behalf of um, the Surveyor General of the Federation, the management and staff of the Office of the Surveyor General of the Federation. I, Salio Mohai Kabo, Director Infrastructure Service, want to appreciate the NIS for a successful outing. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we recognize all the staff of Bosco present here. You are wonderful. And FCD also, we recognize you especially. You are all welcome. Thank you. Please permit me before I call on the chairman board of fellows to recognize the executive of the board to stand for special recognition. Please, the executive of the board of fellows, please stand for recognition, please. Please, you hand over to us for there. Thank you so much. Now I'll hand over the mic 
to the chairman of the board for the good word message. Uh, Mr. President, the Senior General of the Federation, represented by Senior Mrs. Ekago Ebenahes, Second President, and uh, other members of, uh, oh no, sorry, I can't. Uh, go without mentioning the representative of the past president on the high table, <laughs> so we have Professor Venerable uh, Afolabi Fajemi Rukum, Emeritus Professor, OON, uh, a distinguished Nigerian, and um, also the deputy president seated. Uh, my fellow past presidents, Fellows of the Nigerian of Soviets and other members, uh, Soviets here present, and the um, audience who are those who are not Soviets, which are supposed to have them here, because this is a, a public lecture. We are not supposed to be speaking to ourselves, and therefore, I, I hope that we have a uh, representative of the public here present with us that we have invited. Uh, let me say by first of all congratulating the uh, president and the executive and also the Nation of Soviet for this successful outing today. Let me go down memory lane a little bit. When this lecture was noted by the uh, then leadership of this profession, led by uh, late uh, Ukoyi, Past President Bukoyi, the idea of this lecture was a celebration of service, excellence, to honor those that have worked uh, in uplifting and ensuring that we have a profession that has been handed, robots that have been handed over to us. And in that process, we will honor uh, a lecture to honor uh, our first past. First and the life president, pa, in fact, that pa should be included anytime you call our past president, pa, children of Cyprian, Olumide. And in honoring in that every occasion, that occasion is expected to also recognize the work done by the uh, living past presidents. And therefore, it is a um, an occasion for excellence, celebration of excellence. And when we do this, we recognize the work done by them. And an honor. It's an honor to be a leader of a professional body. And therefore, um, in entering our service, we should always put that honor behind, I mean, in our mind, so that we put a service before self. Let me say that uh, NIS has done so very well so far. Um, we have organized 40, uh, the 40th edition, and uh, each year is expected to be getting better. Uh, this is not the time to state a little bit of some anomalies. When we together, we we'll talk um, to ourselves. Well, let me say that um, the the person that we are celebrating was a unifier. Respective of where we come from, we see Soviets as one. Of late, we tend to be disintegrating, to be recognizing ourselves as this belong to here, this belong to that. We must not allow our differences to separate us. We must all come together as one. As surveyors. First and foremost, we must see ourselves as surveyors. When I was president of NIS, I didn't see myself as representing a section of the country. I saw my, and that's exactly what happens to all the past presidents. We are one, and when we are there, our aim should be to uplift the profession and give it a pride of place, not only in Nigeria, but in the community of nations. And um, on behalf of the members of the Board of Fellows and Executive, 
Uh, I want to say that um, we want to congratulate NIS residents. We produce about 60% of ESCO members. And therefore, the, if there is a failure of the institution, it's the failure of the Board of Fellows. And therefore, what we are trying to do is to re-engineer that body to ensure that we conquer the sense of service in the uh, members so that when they go up to serve, they recognize in themselves, they are representing not themselves, but body of fellows, and also they have a duty to service. Once again, on behalf of uh, the executive and all members of the board of fellows, I want to congratulate us for what we have done so far. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so, so much, sir. With the permission and the honor from the president, I want to call on our senior Dr. Emoe Itoye FNIs, the deputy president, and the incoming president, so to say. Sir, you can stand today. You don't need to come up for the vote of thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, my Chair, the President of NIS, the Olumide family, represented by Mr. Akinshola. Am I correct, sir? Oh. And the my emeritus professor, past president, second president, other past president here present, second members, the representative of SUF, other government functionaries, fellows, leaders and head of some groups. I want to appreciate you for making a day like this. It has been a wonderful outing for NIS and for all of us. And also on behalf of the President and the entire Council to appreciate you for coming and make today's occasion a wonderful one. If we invited you and you refused to come, we will be talking to MG Chair. And you have been part of today's program as hard color to this program. I want to appreciate you all for coming. Let me again thank our guest lecturer, though in absentia, for allowing to speak to us today despite the fact of his time schedule. He whispered to Mr. President when we are escorting him out that he has another assignment right now at the National Assembly. Just a short window for this exercise, he came around to deliver a very wonderful lecture. Uh, one question I would have love to ask that among all the military governors that have served, his name still remain in the marketplace. Keke Marua, Keke Marua. I don't believe anyone in this country has not gotten to that. Once again, I want to appreciate you for coming. It is a wonderful time to spend together. And it is my prayer, by this time next year, we shall all be here to celebrate. All our past president, I appreciate you. You are looking radiating and, uh, and I'm sure next year we are going to be here together. Once again, I thank you all. Thank you. President, sir, in closing this for the annual Olumide Memorial Lecture with dangers of illicit substances to national development. I wish we stand to our feet as we take the national anthem.
together. O God of creation, direct our noble cause, guide our leaders right, help our youth the truth to know, in love and honesty to grow, and living just and true, great lofty heights attain, to build the nation where peace and justice shall reign. Okay.